Section 6 of Thoughts on Art and Life Thoughts on Art, Part 1 Painting Declines When Aloof from Nature The painter's work will be of little merit if he takes the painting of others as his standard. But if he studies from nature he will produce good fruits, as is seen in the case of the painters of the age after the Romans, who continued to imitate one another and whose art consequently declined from age to age. After these came Giotto the Florentine, who was born in the lonely mountains, inhabited only by goats and similar animals, and he, being drawn to his art by nature, began to draw on the rocks the doings of the goats of which he was the keeper, and thus he likewise began to draw all the animals which he met with in the country, so that after long study he surpassed not only all the masters of his age, but all those of many past centuries. After him art relapsed once more, because all artists imitated the painted pictures, and thus from century to century it went on declining, until Tommaso the Florentine, called Masaccio, proved by his perfect work that they who set up for themselves a standard other than nature, the mistress of all masters, labor in vain. Thus I wish to say, in regard to these mathematical matters, that they who merely study the masters and not the works of nature are the grandchildren and not the children of nature, the mistress of good masters. I abhor the supreme folly of those who blame the disciples of nature in defiance of those masters who were themselves her pupils. Its Origin The first picture was a single line, drawn round the shadow of a man cast by the sun on the wall. Vastness of the field of painting. All that is visible is included in the science of painting. Defense of painting. With due lamentation, painting complains that it has been expelled from the liberal arts because it is the true daughter of nature and is practiced by means of the most worthy of the senses. Whence wrongly, O oh writers, you have excluded painting from the liberal arts, since it not only includes in its range the works of nature, but also infinite things which nature never created. Because writers have had no knowledge of the science of painting, they have not been able to describe its gradations and parts, and since painting itself does not reveal itself nor its artistic work in words, it has remained, owing to ignorance, behind the sciences mentioned above, but it has thereby lost nothing of its divinity. And truly it is not without reason that men have failed to honor it, because it does honor to itself without the aid of the speech of others, just as do the excellent works of nature. And if the painters have not described the art of painting, and reduced it to a silence, the fault must not be imputed to painting and it is no less noble on that account, since few painters profess a knowledge of letters, as their life would not be long enough for them to acquire such knowledge. Therefore, we ask, is the virtue of herbs, stones, and plants non-existent, because men have been ignorant of it? Certainly not. But we will say that these herbs remain noble in themselves without the aid of human tongues or letters. Painting a science is more useful in proportion as its fruits are more widely understood, and thus, on the other hand, it is less useful in proportion as it is less widely understood. The fruits of painting can be apprehended by all the populations of the universe because its results are subject to the power of sight, and it does not pass by the ear to the brain, but by the same channel by which sight passes. Therefore it needs no interpreters of diverse tongues, as letters do, and it has instantly satisfied the human race in the same manner as the works of nature have done. And not only the human race, but other animals, as was shown in a picture representing the father of a family to whom little children still in the cradle gave caresses, as did the dog and the cat in the same house. And it was a wonderful thing to see such a sight. The arts which admit of exact reproduction are such that the disciple is on the same level as the creator, 
and so it is with their fruits. These are useful to the imitator, but are not of such high excellence as those which cannot be transmitted as an inheritance like other substances. Among these, painting is the first. Painting cannot be taught to him on whom nature has not conferred the gift of receiving such knowledge, as mathematics can be taught, of which the disciple receives as much as the master gives him. It cannot be copied, as letters can be, in which the copy equals the original. It cannot be stamped, in the same way as sculpture, in which the impression is in proportion to the source as regards the quality of the work. It does not generate countless children, as do printed books. It alone remains noble. It alone confers honor on its author, and remains precious and unique, and does not beget children equal to itself. And it is more excellent by reason of this quality than by reason of those which are everywhere proclaimed. Now do we not see the great monarchs of the East going about veiled and covered up from the fear of diminishing their glory by manifestation and by the divulgation of their presence? And do we not see that the pictures which represent the divine deity are kept covered up with inestimable veils? Their unveiling is preceded by great sacred solemnities with various chants and diverse music, and when they are unveiled, the vast multitude of people who are there flocked together immediately prostrate themselves and worship and invoke those whom such pictures represent, that they may regain their lost holiness and win eternal salvation, just as if the deity were present in the flesh. This does not occur in any other art or work of man. And if you say that is owing to the nature of the subject depicted rather than to the genius of the painter, the answer is that the mind of man could satisfy itself equally well in this case, were the man to remain in bed and not make pilgrimages to places which are perilous and hard of access, as we so often see is the case. But if such pilgrimages continually exist, what is then their unnecessary cause? You will certainly admit that it is an image of this kind, and all the writings in the world could not succeed in representing the semblance and power of such a deity. Therefore it appears that this deity takes pleasure in the pictures, and is pleased that it should be loved and revered, and takes a greater delight in being worshipped in that rather than in any other semblance of itself, and by reason of this it bestows grace and gifts of salvation according to the belief of those who meet together in such a place. Painting excels all the works of man. The eye, which is called the window of the soul, is the principal means by which the brain can most abundantly and splendidly contemplate the infinite works of nature, and the ear is the next in order, which is ennobled by hearing the recital of the things seen by the eye. If you, historians and poets, or mathematicians, had not seen things with the eyes, you could not report of them in writing. If thou, O poet, dost tell a story with thy painting pen, the painter will more easily give satisfaction in telling it with his brush, and in a manner less tedious and more easily understood. And if thou callest painting mute poetry, the painter can call poetry blind painting. Now consider which is the greater loss, to be blind or dumb. Though the poet is as free as the painter in his creations and compositions, they are not so satisfactory to men as paintings, because if poetry is able to describe forms, actions, and places in words, the painter deals with the very semblance of forms in order to represent them. Now consider which is nearer to man, the name of man or the image of man. The name of man varies in diverse countries, but death alone changes his form. If thou wast to say that painting is more lasting, I answer that the works of a coppersmith, which time preserves longer than thine or ours, are more eternal still. Nevertheless, there is but little invention in it, and painting on copper with colors of enamel is far more lasting. We, by our art, can be called the grandsons of God. 
if poetry deals with moral philosophy, painting deals with natural philosophy. If poetry describes the action of the contemplative mind, painting represents the effect in motion of the action of the mind. If poetry terrifies people with the pictures of hell, painting does the same by depicting the same things in action. If a poet challenges the painter to represent beauty, fierceness, or an evil, an ugly, or a monstrous thing, whatever variety of forms he may produce in his way, the painter will cause greater satisfaction. Are there not pictures to be seen so like reality that they deceive men and animals? Painting creates reality. The imagination is to the effect as the shadow to the opaque body which causes the shadow, and the proportion is the same between poetry and painting. Because poetry produces its results in the imagination of the reader, and painting produces them in a concrete reality outside the eye, so that the eye receives its images just as if they were the works of nature, and poetry produces its results without images, and they do not pass to the brain through the channel of the visual faculty, as in painting. Painting represents to the brain the works of nature with greater truth and accuracy than speech or writing, but letters represent words with greater truth, which painting does not do. But we say that the science which represents the works of nature is more wonderful than that which represents the works of the artificer, that is to say, the works of man, which consist of words such as poetry and the like which issue from the tongue of man. The painter goes to nature. Painting ministers to a nobler sense than poetry, depicts the forms of the works of nature with greater truth than poetry, and the works of nature are nobler than the words which are the works of man, because there is the same proportion between the works of man and those of nature as there is between man and God. Therefore, it is a more worthy thing to imitate the works of nature, which are the true images embodied in reality, than to imitate the actions and the words of men. And if thou, O poet, wishest to describe the works of nature by thine unaided art, and dost represent various places and the forms of diverse objects, the painter surpasses thee by an infinite degree of power. But if thou wishest to have recourse to the aid of other sciences, apart from poetry, they are not thy own. For instance, astrology, rhetoric, theology, philosophy, geometry, arithmetic, and the like. Thou art not then a poet any longer. Thou transformest thyself, and art no longer that of which we are speaking. Now seest thou not that if thou wishest to go to nature, Thou reachest her by the means of science, deduced by others from the effects of nature. And the painter threw himself alone, without the aid of aught appertaining to the various sciences, or by any other means, achieves directly the imitation of the things of nature. By painting, lovers are attracted to the images of the beloved to converse with the depicted semblance. By painting, whole populations are led with fervent vows to seek the image of the deities, and not to see the books of poets which represent the same deities in speech. By painting, animals are deceived. I once saw a picture which deceived a dog by the image of its master, which the dog greeted with great joy, and likewise I have seen dogs bark at and try to bite painted dogs, and a monkey make a number of antics in front of a painted monkey. I have seen swallows fly and alight on painted ironworks which jut out of the windows of buildings. Superiority of Painting to Philosophy Painting includes in its range the surface, color, and shape of anything created by nature, and philosophy penetrates into the same bodies and takes notes of their essential virtue, but it is not satisfied with that truth, as is the painter who seizes hold of the primary truth of such bodies, because the eye is less prone to deception. Painting and Poetry 
poetry surpasses painting in the representation of words, and in the representation of actions painting excels poetry. And painting is to poetry as actions are to words, because actions depend on the eye and words on the ear. And thus the senses are in the same proportion one to another as the objects on which they depend. And on this account I consider painting to be superior to poetry. But since those who practice painting were for long ignorant as to how to explain its theory, it lacked advocates for a considerable time, because it does not speak itself, but reveals itself and ends in action, and poetry ends in words, which in its vainglory it employs for self-praise. End of section 6